Yeah, so I'm used to that. Well, it, we have this very comprehensive time range of seminars that, um, in this particular session. And this is a particular Maudlin occasion because I'm a Maudlin fellow and I'm introducing two Maudlin fellows. So we started with the very origins of violence and now we're really bringing it up to the present day with two people who really know their field. One who's um, done a lot of work on unconventional warfare, nuclear warfare, chemical warfare, and a lot of the leading war fronts of the current situation, most recently in Ukraine. And then John Simpson, who has recorded the terrible effects of such warfare, which went back to Lucha just earlier, that terrible chemical attack in, in Iraq. So we couldn't have two better people to give an introduction, an outline of some of these terrible issues of how warfare has changed, and someone who will respond and tell us how can we cope with this particular situation. So over to Hamish, followed by John. They need no further introduction. <laughs> Right. Well, thanks very much. It's it's a massive honour to be here. You know, I always feel a bit of an imposter in these sort of uh, things. Uh, you know, especially here at Cambridge. I uh, my <laughs> academic record. You know, I have a I have one A level. I have a third class degree in agriculture. Just <laughs> um, and uh, and you know, massive honour to be a fellow at, at, at Magdalen. I think what perhaps what I bring to this is um, thirty six years of experience on the battlefields of the world. Uh, 25 as a soldier and the last sort of um, 11 as a humanitarian and various other bits and bobs. Uh, and John, of course, ha has, has more than that. But I think we look at perhaps warfare from very different perspectives. Most of mine has been as a soldier or as somebody who is trying to achieve things. And perhaps, you know, to my guilt, I've, people like John, I've tried to convince them uh, to, to tow my line, as it were, rather than a, a balanced view, which is exactly what um, what, what the, the the media and, and the, the key people in it partake. Um, I think it's a hugely interesting time, and I was trying to shape when when uh, Simon originally asked me to talk and gave me the, the sort of the title of the lecture. I must say, I actually had to you know do a bit of research here on. on you know, what, how best to look at it. And I've written a lot recently about what I call unconventional warfare. And that, that is really my thesis. And what I'm trying to do um, over the next 40 minutes before, um, before John comes in, is, is try and make it relevant to, to, to what you guys do. Um, you know, in, in the archeological world, you are trying to, I suppose, find out what happened and uh, perhaps suggest ways that that, um, that we can do better in future. Now, I realise that, that a lot of the work that you do here is, is, is in the distant past, whereas I'm, I'm just sort of looking at yesterday and today and trying to prevent it happening again tomorrow. But I think for me, evidence collection is a key thing, and that's what I have focused a lot of my life on post leaving the military, collecting evidence. And I'll give you a few examples. I, I do teach at universities quite a lot, and not, not this university, but you know, sometimes you get sent these great sort of reams of teaching points and things you must cover. I think every university now knows who asks me to speak that that's a complete waste of time. <laughs> um, you, what you're going to get is about 35 to 40 minutes of, of stories loosely linked together, loosely on the subject that I've been asked to talk about. But I think, um, you know, I, I am embedded in Ukraine at the moment, so I do apologise if I refer to it rather too much. But um, quite frankly, you know, with everything else going on in the world, desperately, sadly, and I, you know, I'll try not to be political, you know, if we don't sort Ukraine out in the right way, then a lot of these other things uh, will sadly be become irrelevant. I think the, you know, it is a bizarre time, you know, we are... My background is in chemical, biological, and radiological, nuclear counterterrorism and warfare. Now, I've lived most of my life in the shadows for very good reasons, not least because it hasn't been a huge issue, but um, it is now. It, it is a significant issue, and um, it's something we must confront. And I, I'll say one of the things up front, you know, any threat can be mitigated if you plan against it. If you stick your head in the sand and try to ignore it, 
that is when you fall, fall down. And that is the same for chemical, biological, and nuclear. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, just, just hold that thought. And I think, you know, we are in the moment just one misjudgment, misinterpretation of events for a disaster to happen. And it's absolutely key that, um, that people in leadership positions elsewhere, you know, absolutely focus on that. Only, only Tuesday this week, the missile attack into Poland. You know, that night, some of us thought that, you know, we were close to NATO getting involved directly in the fight in Ukraine. Now, thankfully, um, there was a pause, find out what's going on, have all the information and give our leaders actionable intelligence. And to me, that is that is information that is useful in a timely fashion so they can make decisions. And thankfully, they waited to get the information that actually it wasn't as it first transpired. But um, hopefully the Russians do now realise that, you know, any missiles well, any missiles in Ukraine are desperate, but any missiles outside um, might well bring in something that they don't want. Um, I don't like talking about myself, um, but just to give you a bit of back where, where I sort of come from, from my military career, I, it's sort of, I know it's in the bio and all the rest of it. I would say the most, um, the most amazing and important time that I've had was probably with the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga are the Iraqi Kurd military. Um, I first got involved in, in, in northern Iraq, actually, with a place called Halabja, uh, which is where I probably first met John, and we went out and, and, and uh, covered the 25th anniversary. But um, I, I will cover that as a, as, a, as a sort of segue into collecting evidence. But uh, after that was back in 2012, when, when the fight with ISIS started in, in um, in you know in full, full fold as it were from about 2015 on i then became the peshmerga's chemical uh weapons advisor um and actually i was i was with them in mosul when islamic state fired chlorine mortars at us so i have personal experience of being gassed and and that was very informative to me you know i was terribly excited um <laughs> the peshmerga thought i was absolutely bonkers um but i said look you, you, you'll see this green yellow vapor smoke you know as long as you don't breathe in you'll be fine um and actually that experience and and leading them through it had a profound effect we were not affected by any of islamic states they fired more chlorine uh, at uh peshmerga forces and also mustard agent mustard gas too um and one of, one of the things about chemicals which i'll come back to the the psychological impact is sort of 10 as to one the physical and that's you know, I try to explain to people in Syria and 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 the Peshmerga. You know, only only point zero one percent of casualties in the First World War and since have been caused by chemical weapons. So why worry about them? But um, I, I was telling this to some uh, doctors in Syria, probably 2014, 2015, and they they said, Hamish, hey, that's all very well, but we can hide from bombs and bullets. We can't hide from gas, and that's why. I think it's um, it's so significant, a weapon. I The next thing I'm gonna say might really um, surprise you. When it comes to unconventional threats, you know, in my opinion, and all of this is my opinion, by the way, whatever, whatever I have on my CV and whoever I might you know, also work for, I'm talking purely as Hamish DBG here. I think if you have no morals or scruples, you would use chemical and biological and nuclear weapons all of the time because they're so effective. Um, and that is a real concern because a lot of our adversaries have no morals or scruples. And um, the, uh, I use the, the main example for this um, is a place called Aleppo in north, uh, northeast Syria. Um, I was there in December 2016 with an absolute legend, a fellow called Dr. David Knott, who wrote a brilliant book called uh, War Doctor. Um, and he is incredible. He does stuff in Ukraine now as well, um, uh, operating on the front line. Uh, but we were there trying to um, rescue 500 children, uh, which we did manage to do in the end, but we had to negotiate with Assad and with Putin. 
Um, and David had worked with Assad when he was an ophthalmist, uh, an eye surgeon in London before he went back to be a tyrant in Syria. So we actually had his personal mobile phone number. And um, David had also operated on the Russian ambassador in London. So we had his personal <laughs> number. And we managed to negotiate a 24-hour ceasefire in December 2016 and got these 500 orphans out uh, of Aleppo. And um, But at, at that time, there were two significant things that happened. First of all, I got a note from the Russian ambassador from Putin saying he was getting increasingly angry of me accusing uh, Assad of using chemical weapons. And for the good of my own health, I should stop doing it. Um, so that was one thing. Um, and the, the other thing was... Um, preceding that, uh, the four-year siege of Aleppo, the four-year conventional siege of Aleppo, where the Russians and the Syrians had been dropping tons and tons of missiles and ordnance on Aleppo and raising it to the ground, had been broken by 15 days of chlorine attack. And uh, that really, to me, and the, the dreadful thing was, and I'd, I'd purposely not put any nasty pictures up and all the rest of it, but... In Aleppo, the chlorine barrel bombs, these are 500 kilogram barrels of liquid chlorine. They hit the ground, heavier than air, they sink underground. And what they did is they killed mainly women and children on the ground or forced people above ground where they were captured and shot. And that worked incredibly well in Aleppo. They repeated it in 2017 in Ghouta, which is a suburb of Damascus. And in 2018, a place called Duma, which is also a suburb of Damascus. So, again, that is incredibly successful. I think the other thing, you know, COVID, my, a lot of my area of work at the moment is in biosurveillance. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But I think when one looks at terror, you know, that I am absolutely convinced that COVID, you know, was either a zoonotic transfer or, or an ad leak, whatever it was, an accident. But the fact that it brought the world to a standstill for two years, killed up to five million people, is something from a terror perspective that we really need to focus on. And we know that the Russians have done a lot of work in this area and others. And on the nuclear side, um, what I'm really concerned of is, we, is to me, nuclear is, is one of the key renewable energies we should be um, enhancing. And if we lose faith in it, because potentially what's happening in Ukraine, I think it's going to affect us uh, for many years to come. Now, what do I mean by um, unconventional violence or unconventional warfare? I think as I said at the beginning, the heart of it is attacking civilians, putting civilians at the target, um, we, we saw it, and a lot of, this might sound super cynical, but a lot of the stuff I saw in Syria, and I spent 10 years in and out of Syria, and I'm, you know, in theory, I will go into Syria if required now. But, but what we saw there was the deliberate targeting of civilians because uh, the Assad regime and the Russians, you know, the, the, the rebels and all these various disparate groups were very difficult for them to attack. Uh, and Assad wanted to get back the rest of his country. Northwest Syria, Idlib, was pretty much um, you know, out of his grasp. But what he tried to do was create enough civilian casualties that either they would flee the country, and, and let's not forget five million Syrians uh, you know, were refugees out of Syria. Still, I think a couple of million in Turkey and pe pe others have gone around the world. And I, I personally have sponsored five Syrian doctors of, for, for asylum in this country and so far four of them have got it and I think that's brilliant we now have four brilliance in fact some of the most experienced surgeons in the world and a very dear friend of mine has just requalified at Newcastle University so if you get shot in Newcastle the chances that you are going to get him to patch you up you know is flipping good news um, <laughs> there's nobody better at it so there's, that's the civilians hospitals are the other key you know how do you break the will you know, as a soldier, I was always very happy to get out of the trench and advance towards the enemy, as it were, if I knew that there was somebody who would patch me up if I was shot. When you know that that's not the case, 
it makes it very difficult making that step. And it's the same for everybody. I think we must be all the same. So in Syria, Assad directly attacked hospitals. And, and I, a lot of the work I did was for a charity called OSAM, the Union of Syrian Medical Charities. It's actually a French acronym, which I wouldn't even try to uh, say what it was, but the English translation is roughly that. And we ran all of the hospitals and medical facilities in North West Syria. Um, the Geneva Convention states that, that um, any areas of particular, uh, which should be protected like hospitals, religious sites, and others, um, basically the UN collect, collects the data and then makes sure all opposing sides had that data so they could be protected. What we found is when we set up a hospital in Aleppo or in Lib or Sarakeb, um, we'd give the grid reference to uh, the UN the next day we'd get a precision guided missile through that hospital. We lost a thousand doctors and nurses and medics killed between uh, 2014 and up to the present day. Um, again, that was part of it. Schools, yeah, I'm sure you've seen what, what uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, schools have been attacked in Ukraine, uh, actually when children were going to school in the morning. I mean, you don't get any more cynical than that. Um, Food, making food a weapon. Uh, we, we, again, Ukraine, get over mentioning it, but when Ukraine produces whatever it is, 10% of the world's wheat, and most of that goes to the poorest countries in the world, it's not available, the price goes up. You know, we're moaning here the fact we're paying 190 a gallon for petrol, whereas before the war we were paying 150, and we're paying more for our bread and all the rest of it. But, you know, if you're in, the Sudan, Somalia, somewhere like that, you know, you just can't afford to eat. So again, weaponizing food. Fuel, you know, also is uh, in Ukraine where, where um, Putin has said he's going to switch the lights out and turn the heat off. We've seen that already. There are uh, power cuts at least 50% of the time in Ukraine. The big concern to me is that pre-war, 60% of power in Ukraine came from nuclear. Um, not that I trumpet it, and certainly, you know, I don't say it in public. I'm I'm working very closely with the Ukraine emergency services at the moment, the civil defence, to try and put um, uh, security around the nuclear power stations uh, for, with detectors, uh, so that if there is an accident, we can react in an appropriate way and not create more casualties. Again, I, I don't want to go into too much detail of it, but. Somewhere like Fukushima, the big uh, nuclear accident there, most of the decisions made by the Japanese government were wrong. And most of the people who were evacuated didn't need to be evacuated. It was just that they didn't have that actionable intelligence to hand. And that's what we're trying to do um, in, in Syria to make sure, in Syria, in, uh, in Ukraine, to make sure that we can save as many civilian lives as possible. You will keep see, seeing this reoccurring. Um, and one, one of the things that I learned or we learned in Syria was actually if you could train the civilian population as you would train military to react to these events, you can save a lot of lives. And, and that's exactly what we did in Syria and exactly what I'm doing uh, in Ukraine at the moment. This is on the Telegram app. We're shortly going to put it on the Signal app. Basically, it tells you how to prepare for a, a nuclear accident or attack and what to do in the case of it. Um, a lot of it is counterintuitive, which is why we did it. And in, in Syria, what I, we had similar apps for chemical attacks. Um, and in the end, it saved a lot of lives because the civilians don't have gas masks or anything like that. And what we would do by um, telling them, you know, if there was a chlorine attack, heavier than air, it floats off in the wind very quickly, get to high ground, run upwind, and, and you'll be fine. And uh, so one thing you can counter in an attack on civilians is to try and train them what to do, however cynical that might seem. I just want to um, cover a little bit about what, what I mean by unconventional violence in, in the areas that I have been um, heavily involved in. Uh, and I break it in chem, bio, radiological and nuclear. You know, on the chemical side, I, I live in just outside Salisbury, in the West Country which um, is, of course, where the Russians had a, a attack with nerve agent Novichok, 
Now, one of the super cynical things about that, there was enough Novichok, this is what we call a fourth generation nerve agent. There was only a quarter of an egg cup of it, but there was enough of it to kill tens of thousands of people. Now, Putin was trying to kill one person, Sergei Skripal, uh, which he didn't achieve, uh, and he, but he did kill a civilian, Dawn Sturgis. But it could have been, you know, even worse, tens and tens of thousands of times worse. And that, that is a concern. You know, we, you might have heard a lot about Russian false flag attacks, claiming that the other side is going to attack and then do it themselves. And in, in Ukraine and in Syria, we had both chemical and biological uh, false flag attacks. And, and of course, recently in Ukraine, the Russians have claimed that there's going to be a big dirty bomb attack. Dirty bomb is basically where you get some uh, radiological isotopes and, and blow them up with conventional explosives, spreading contamination around. Um, I personally don't believe any of his false flag type stuff. What um, on the chemical side, you know, what, what I saw in Syria and in Iraq with the Peshmerga is, is not so much using what we call traditional chemical warfare agents, um, more toxic industrial chemicals. You know, one of the issues, and I suppose why am I talking to this audience about this? Um, operating in a contaminated space is a huge challenge. And when you people have to go to Ukraine or Syria or wherever it is in future to find out what actually happened, um, these are some of the considerations you're going to have to look at. And, um, and I'll give a couple of examples, which hopefully will give you something to, to think about. So toxic industrial chemicals. Um, I got hugely, one of the challenges in Syria was getting evidence of chemical attacks out. We have something called the Organization of the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which polices the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, they could only go into Syria to uh, collect evidence if they were invited to by the Syrian regime, which of course, most of the time they weren't. I was in Parliament on September in September 2013 when the government had a debate on whether we should strike Assad of the huge chemical attack in Ghouta in, on the 21st of August 2013 that killed 1,500 people, mainly women and children. And we voted not to do anything. Remember the year before we had the Obama red line, any use of chemical weapons would cross a red line and the West would act. Now, I was briefing politicians. I wrote notes to the prime minister. I wrote notes to the leader of the opposition saying, this is the situation. We must do something. Of course, history relates, we didn't. We didn't. We voted not to do anything. And I think that red line really evaporated and is part of the reason that Putin felt so confident that he could invade Ukraine in February this year. And what, I'll come back to that. You know, if if people like Obama, I'm trying to remember who the prime minister is here these days, <laughs> yeah, Rishi Sunak and others, if they are going to make demonstrative claims, they've got to back them up because there are tyrants around who, if they think there's a chink, will take the most of it. Moving on rapidly to uh, bio, bio. I, um, I, you know, supposedly one of the world's leading experts in this stuff, I completely dismissed bio, biological weapons as being something too difficult, too slow to act, um, too easy to defend against. And then we had COVID, a not very virulent pathogen, as I mentioned earlier, that brought its world to the knees. There's a, another fellow in, in Maudlin, and um, I'm, I'm sure Simon will know his name, it, it escapes me, who is a virologist and he dealt with a Lassa fever um, uh, outbreak in Suffolk. Uh, it was earlier this year or the end of last year. Lassa fever, very deadly pathogen, 80% mortality rate. Uh, I think killed one of the three people who got it. You know, while with the way synthetic biology is going at the moment, you don't need to be a PhD. Uh, you don't need laboratories like we have here at Cambridge to be able to actually manipulate the genome of something like Lassa fever, splice it with something like sars cov to produce something really nasty. Um, and I think we mustn't forget COVID. You know, there were, uh, not because I'm working on biosurveillance at the moment, but you sort of, one gets the feeling that, uh, that our politicians and everyone else forgetting about COVID, moving on to the next thing. Well, 
if we don't, now that we know that bio is an issue, if we don't prepare and, and if we prepare, we can mitigate, then the next pandemic, the next pathogen could turn into a pandemic, which is a more concern. And oh, by the way, we know that the Russians are working, they seem to be working on Ebola um, as their weapon of choice. Um, now, I don't, I, I know that this is all pretty horrific stuff, I, 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 and I don't mean to make it that way. My, my overriding aim, my overriding theme is as long as you uh, appreciate these type of threats, you can produce defence against them and mitigate against them. And as long as you stick to your red lines, people are not going to do them. But this, you know, this, as you people know, you know, the, the, this uncontrollable violence is happens. It's out there. It's happened throughout history. We cannot stick our heads in the sand. Uh, a little bit about nuclear. Um, uh, I've mentioned some of the issues with dirty bomb. Again, I've always thought dirty bomb is an anathema. Actually, if you blow up some radiological isotopes, um, sure you'll get some contamination. The biggest thing is going to be actually sorting out that contamination. As an effect on people, it's going to be relatively minor. Um, you know, but depending on how much you get. I mean, we're all we're all getting irradiated all of the time. I live in a radon area down in the West Country. You know, I get more radiation than a than a worker at um, you know Hinkley Point or or Sellafield. You know, it's as long as you can control that radiation. And if anybody's been on a transatlantic flight at the moment, you're getting three or four times the annual dose of radiation that that these workers get. But it's it's knowing what you're getting. <laughs> to me, the nuclear side, I sort of bit of my sort of vote for, for, for nuclear, but I, I was asked to be on LBC a few months ago for an hour with the uh, original founder of Extinction Rebellion. And I, I, my initial reaction was, crikey, you know, we, I'm not sure we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, but uh, not, not that I, you know, I, you know, their aims are very worthy, but, but I'm not the sort of person that would necessarily uh, get heavily involved in them. But, a lady called Zara Lights, and do, do look her up. She is an incredible person. Um, she uh, actually, she now advocates, as do Greenpeace and others, uh, on the nuclear side. So, you know, I was talking about how desperate it would be if we lost faith in nuclear power. And actually, Zion was saying, well, you know, this has got to be a key part of our renewable peace in future. And, um, you know, looking at what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, with the weaponization of these nuclear power stations. I was mentioning to some of you outside, you know, when the Russians took uh, Chernobyl at the beginning of the war, because it was on a key um, advancing route for the military, uh, they dug in there. I mean, Chernobyl is still very contaminated and apparently 150 soldiers died from radiation poisoning, which really shows the callousness and, and actually the, you know, the, the, just the poor skills of the Russian military. If, if you're going to send people into a rate into a nuclear power station, you expect to give them the wherewithal to be able to deal with this sort of stuff. Um, the concern the Russians run Zaporizhia at the moment. They talk about these false flags. We've had lots of uh, munitions landing around it. If it did explode, um, lots of people are saying you wouldn't do it because the contamination would go to Russia. Well, actually, it wouldn't. You know, the latest meteorological conditions. Uh, and certainly over the last few months, actually, the radiation is coming this way. And anybody who lives in Wales will know that after Chernobyl, a lot of radiation fell in North Wales and uh, a lot of farmers can sh sell sheep for 10 years or so. So there be the concern. Now, on to the, I've, I've just got two slides left and I will, um, although we just start five minutes late, so I'll, I'll, I shall keep going. So the challenges for evidence. Let me case study one, Halabja. So 15, the 16th of March, 1988, Saddam Hussein forces attacked Halabja with uh, the nerve agent sarin, um, with a whole host of other chemical weapons, probably mustard agents as well, uh, killed 5,000 people within the first two hours, subsequently 12,000 people died. And I think John was one of the first journalists into Halabja. Um, after that happened, uh, which is remarkable. But, you know, some of the pictures that you see, absolutely 
yeah, nerve agent kills people very quickly, almost as though they're, they're frozen as statues. Um, but this was, this was part of something called the Anfal campaign, where Saddam Hussein was trying to exterminate the Kurdish race. Um, he did kill about 400,000 between uh, 1984 and 1988, which is unbelievable. And a significant amount, there were about 84 other chemical attacks. But Halabja is the one which sort of woke the world up. But th there was also a red line. You know, ourselves and the Americans in the, in the mid 80s had issued this red line on the use of chemical weapons. You know, sadly, we didn't do a great deal about it. But I, I've, I've had two, only two good, I've had two good ideas in my life. Bizarrely, they both happened in Afghanistan. Um, the first one, I, I was actually doing an intelligence job but um, a, a chap who I suddenly found out was part of the MI6 operation in Afghanistan came up to me and said, I gather you're the world's expert in chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, well, I'm not sure I am. And he said, we've checked our records and <laughs> you're the most qualified person here. So I went, okay. He said, we've got 60 tons of toxic chemicals uh, that the Taliban using to synthesize heroin. It's all bubbling away. We think it's about to explode. Can you sort it out? And uh, I was thinking, oh, crikey, uh, I had no kit with me or anything. But to cut a very long story short, I basically had 30 tons of acid, 30 tons of alkali. And um, I was on the phone to Portland Down, and they, they were coming up with all these fanciful ideas. They say, put it in a truck, drive it into the desert, dig a big hole and blow it up. And I was going, yeah, what, three, 3,000 Taliban fighters? You must be joking. <laughs> um, and then I said, well, Acid alkaline, why don't we mix it all together? Surely we'll get a pH 7 solution, then we can chuck it in the river. After about 24 hours, the greatest chemical and brains in the country, or some of them, came back and said, you, uh, yeah, yeah, actually that might work. Um, make sure you lose, use lots of water so you don't get a, a hypothermic explosion. Um, anyway, we did that and we chucked it in the river. Um, and subsequent, only last year when we had the Beirut explosion, which was 2,700 tons of ammonia nitrate. I, I was actually called in to produce a remediation plan for that. And um, my experiences in, in Afghanistan were key. The other point, I'm digressing, as always going off. The other, the other idea I had, I was, we, were, we were collecting personnel intelligence, basically DNA of, uh, of, of um, uh, improvised explosive devices, uh, taking the trace DNA off it, and then when, when people were captured, if you could match the DNA of the personnel and the bombs, you could then put, give them to the Afghan courts to be prosecuted. Uh, but in the early days, this was taking uh, 14 days because we sent the DNA back to the UK to be sequenced. I then remembered that when I was doing biological warfare, we actually used DNA sequences to do that. So, so we brought those out to Afghanistan and turned it into a three hour process. Um, why am I telling you this? Well, Halabja. So the trouble we had in Halabja, we've got 5,000 people in mass graves contaminated because they died of nerve agent poisoning. They died of mustard gas poisoning. When John and I were there in 2012, um, John will tell the story much better. His cameraman probably got a lung full of mustard gas. Um, the cellars in Halabja, even 25 late, years later, some of them were still contaminated. Um, the graves are still contaminated. So I came up with a plan, right, we will create a hot zone over the cave, uh, over the graves. Uh, we will take our DNA sequences into the hot zone. We will analyze DNA from, from the bodies. This was being done for the International Commission for Missing Persons, by the way. And then we'll find people and, uh, and that. And, and that, that was a great plan. Um, it was, you know, gonna be there for a couple of years. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, but then ISIS appeared and it all went up in a puff of smoke. So that is going to be a challenge. Duma, I mentioned Duma earlier on. Now, I set up something called the Severn Task Force in Syria. This was to basically protect civilians. When we had the big attack in 2013, in March 2013 that I mentioned, our clinic, our hospital treated most of the casualties. On the morning of the 21st of August, we had nine doctors treating. Seven of them died from cross-contamination because they just didn't know what, what was up. So what I then did was uh, set up all the hospitals in Syria, in, in Idlib, northwest Syria, with detectors so that they could work out 
what it was and we wouldn't get the, the contamination. And the other thing was evidence. You know, I, I am still struck by the British government voting not to do anything about the big attack on the 21st of August. And I was told when I said, you you know, you're crazy. They said we hadn't got the evidence. So the Seabrain Task Force was set up to collect that evidence. So we would go in behind the enemy lines, get the evidence and get it out again. And again, this is an evidential thing. Duma, we were surrounded on all sides by Syrian forces. The only way we could get the evidence out was going through the lines to the border with Turkey and the evidence to the UN. Um, but one of the other critical things was the chain of evidence. You know, a lot of the time I was actually going into Syria and taking the evidence out myself. Um, but here I had people on the ground and, uh, you know, it was a, I was asking people to try and sneak through Syrian lines with evidence, which I wasn't sure that the chain of evidence was there. And it, you know, despite the fact these very brave people said we'll do it, I said, well, you know, if you get, if we do get out and there's a break in that chain of evidence, it won't be admissible. But, but we've got the evidence here, I know, I know. Um, and the other key thing about evidence, you know, a lot of people in Syria were going, and again, not being political, why aren't you helping us more? Um, uh, and I said, well, you know, it's a political thing. I said, but get evidence. You know, I fought in the Bosnian and Kosovo wars, I was telling them. And now, 12 years later, all those generals who committed atrocities are either dead or in jail in The Hague from evidence that was collected. So get that evidence. So the Duma thing was a real challenge. And in the end, um, in the end, we didn't do it. Uh, and if you follow this at all, you'll know that there is still a lot of angst. There's still a lot of Russian supporters, Syrian supporters who claim, actually claim that I, I created the Duma attack. You know, I was nowhere near it. But because we couldn't get that evidence out, it's very, it's irrefutable. So, and then you throw on top of that all the disinformation and propaganda that's spinning around then and now. So I think those are a few things that um, that that in your business, you, you know, if you're doing more of the contemporary type stuff, the sort of things you need to deal with. Right, I am on to my last slide. The sort of, so what from all of that? Um, red lines, I, I, I don't want to go over and over it, but you know, if you if you make a demonstrative statement, I think you must back it up. Protecting civilians, it's it's shocking. This is nothing new. I mean, I know you know we bombed Dresden dreadfully in in, in the Second World War. Atrocities happen when people fight, um, but that's why we need to collect the evidence so that those responsible um, and you know one must accept you know there are tyrants around. We've got Putin at the moment. We've had a, we've got Assad. You know, we've had Saddam. We've had a whole host of people, um, and it is critical that we protect those civilians who are caught in the middle. Which is why I do whenever I talk to an audience like, like this, I say, if you see this, share it. We're trying to get it into every home and house in Ukraine. It's in Ukrainian and it's in English, and we have one for chemical attack and biological attack. But the radiological, the nuclear thing, some of us. Are, uh, old enough to remember protect and survive during the Cold War. Basically, what I've done is taken that with some very clever graphics from some very clever people from the Thompson Foundation who provide a lot of training to sensitive journalists, but we're now using it for others. Uh, food and fuel, I mean, these are now weapons. They've always been weapons, but they are so much more of an impact in the sort of 22nd century. Uh, 2022s these days, and we must be aware of it. And the infrastructure, um, it is inconceivable why people would want to attack hospitals and schools and power. But, you know, when you cannot, when your opposing force is stronger than you, and you have no morals or scruples, people believe this is fair game. And I suppose that for this audience, evidence collection, is absolutely fundamental. And I know that, you know, perhaps a lot of the evidence that you're working on at the moment is not going to lead to um, people being held accountable. But at the moment, you know, it is. And 
it's got to be right. You know, this business of pro producing evidence that doesn't have the right uh, chain of evidence and details it is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and sadly, there ha have people who have died getting this evidence um, that has not been admissible. But um, get it right. And although we might not be able to save uh, those people in Syria and some people in Ukraine, at some point in time, those responsible will get their comeuppance. Right. Still available in all good bookshops. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've given a wonderful illustration of both horror and hope. And I think the point you were making just then has run through all the seminars of this term, namely that evidence, obviously when we're dealing with evidence of late by Carl in the Bronze Age, we can't go back to the people who are constantly shooting people on the ground as was shown by the forensic science. But here we can really get at the culprits and you've illustrated that absolutely beautifully. We also have the wonderful opportunity of John picking up a few themes both from what Hamish has said and also from your own experience about this modern type of warfare that um, you, you have both witnessed. In a way, when I gave my little talk, when I stepped in because someone was ill, I talked about that. I never experienced violence. I'm a fortunate person who has never, my ancestors were in parts of wars, but I've been fortunate never having done so. But you, the two of you, are witnesses to this. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity to hear how we can both understand it and also prevent it. There is hope, and I hope you can give some illustration of that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, thank you. And I, I must say, Hamish is a real uh, hero of mine because he does, goes to these places and he sees the things. And uh, he, he and I um, uh, traveled to Halabja, and it, it was actually 2013. It was the 25th anniversary. And um, uh, we, I mean, we just followed him round as he was poking around in his cellars, looking inside, opening up doors that the families who lived there had kept shut ever since the uh, Saddam's attacks had taken place because they knew how dangerous it was going to be. And you're quite right, my poor old cameraman uh, had a bit of a, a, a collapse afterwards. I mean, I could feel it in my in my uh, uh, um, nasal passages and everything and in my throat uh, for for days and days after but it is 25 years before that I had actually um, been to Halabja the uh, Iraqi uh, um, Air Force had bombed uh, the uh, the town of Halabja and had done um, appalling damage. And, you know, these figures are very vague, of course, 5,000 people killed, 13,000 died uh, subsequently, or the total was 13,000 subsequently. But um, I uh, was there with um, a Belgium guy, we've talked about him, um, uh, whose name I've now long since forgotten, sadly. But he, he and I went around the town and we had about five hours to do it. And he and I were the ones that came up with the figure of 5,000 because we counted them. And, I, you know, what is so important about what you're saying is this business of evidence-based uh, um, uh, uh, information about what has really, really happened. You know, so many people doubt so many things now, and the whole business of sort of, uh, you know, um, Donald J. Trump approach to reality uh, is to say, if you don't like what's being presented to you, you say, oh, you're lying. It's, it's just fake news. It's not true. It's not true that I lost an election. It's not true. Uh, necessarily that uh, Saddam Hussein attacked uh, a, a Kurdish town and killed 5,000 people. But if you do have the evidence, and we, we had it because we worked for television and we had the images of these things, extraordinary. I shall never, never forget uh, going from house to house um, and seeing the effects of the different 
types of, of, uh, of, of, of chemicals that had been used. And sarin uh, had the effect, I mean, God knows if you want to, you know, if you've got to die, sarin is the way to do it. I went into one particular house where the whole family, about eight or nine of them, were having uh, dinner, had been having dinner. We were there three days later, so it wasn't, uh, we weren't on the spot when the attack happened. But uh, in the, I remember them sitting around, we filmed them, uh, the, the, the bodies as they were sat around there. And you could see two of them, the, a, a woman and a, and a younger man were, died as they were talking to one another and smiling. And one of them was obviously saying, something funny or something, and they just died with those expressions on their faces. Another old man, I remember we, 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 uh, we couldn't use the pictures, but we have the pictures somewhere, um, taking a bite out of a roll of bread, and his teeth were still in the roll, and he died. And they were all, they just sat slumped where, where they were. Other things, I mean, the, um, some of the, the ways that people died are things that I would prefer very much to forget. Uh, mustard gas. I mean, you know, one of the most basic and original things that my uh, great uncle from the First World War suffered with for the suffered from for the rest of his life after being gassed at Passchendaele. I think it was um, red eyes and coughing all the time, poor old boy, coughed for 50, 60 years before he, he finally died of the basic after effects. But it is so important to be able to, to uh, pin these things down and to make certain that people can't say, as Putin's uh, people are saying all the time, Oh, it's, you know, it's made up by the Western media. The Western media has just invented this. I was in um, uh, uh, um, in in uh, Kiev uh, about a month ago. Now went to interview uh, Zelensky, very interesting man, and a, and a man I really, really took to. And I promise you, I don't often take to political leaders, <laughs> um, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll just talk about that in a, in a second. But um, we were there, uh, actually, I suppose he must have known when I interviewed him, but the, there was that attack on the Kerch bridge, which links Crimea to Russia proper. And, um, the, and so I was also there the day after when his kind of revenge was, was carried out, biggest attack that had been excuse me, at that stage on Kiev, I think probably still the biggest attack. And at the start of uh, the attacks on the, the, um, the power stations and on the different ways in which the, the society, in modern society is, is, is uh, uh, held up, you know, is, is, is sustained. Um, and we raced around uh, big, um, um, explosion quite close to our hotel, about, about uh, within walking distance, about four or five minutes. And um, we had, uh, uh, we weren't allowed, the, but the uh, rescue people were still uh, working, trying to get a woman out of a car. And it wasn't obvious to us that it was a woman. In fact, I, I, I assumed because it was the government, the ministry area, uh, I assumed uh, a, it was a drone. It was clearly not a big explosion, so it, it wasn't a, a missile uh, of, of any kind. It, it was a um, an explosive, self-exploding zone uh, drone uh, of the type that the um, uh, Iranians are supplying. Uh, well, they claim they're not, but they, you know, the, let's just say the type that they produce. And weirdly, or even though the Russians uh, don't produce them themselves, are, are actually uh, using. Um, extraordinary how those two things uh, <laughs> uh, are, are denied the link between us. But I assumed, you know, journalists are like uh, Iran, a sort of, uh, the, there's always a, a, a kind of assumption that you want to make links with things. So I assumed, yeah, it's a drone. It was clearly a drone. 
um, must have been following this car. The car must contain somebody of importance, and they've they've blown her up, blown it up. Uh, it turned out, of course, that it was no such thing. It was a woman uh, who was a, a, a cancer specialist, child cancer specialist, specialist in um, uh, bone marrow transplants for children. And she just dropped her kid off at, at his primary school and she was just driving to her hospital and the drone came along and blew her to kingdom come. Um, I can't think of any crime that is worse than, than that, really. I mean, she, they didn't just kill a, 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 a cancer specialist. They also, no doubt, killed lots and lots and lots of children who weren't able to have the, uh, the, the operations that she was the sole expert at uh, in, in Keith at, the, at, at present. So pinning these things down, working out who must have been responsible for these things. I mean, we'll never know about the, the drone attack, but we will know about other things. Just today, I don't know whether anybody saw it as I was uh, coming, uh, uh, I, was, I was in the train from London to Cambridge. Um, the uh, uh, verdicts were handed down in the trial uh, in absentia in Russia of uh, three people who shot down the uh, Malaysian airliner. If you remember going to Australia, 180 people, I think, died on it. It was a mistake. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, deliberate. Uh, I mean, it was deliberate, but it, they didn't know that it was a civilian airliner. They thought that it was um, a Ukrainian aircraft, uh, uh, military aircraft, and they, they shot it down. But of course, uh, it's been thoroughly denied. Again, we've had the old business, this is fake news. Uh, it must have been done by somebody else. Who knows, you know, probably the Ukrainians actually did it themselves in order to put the, the blame on, on Russia. And there are people who are idiotic enough uh, and biased enough to believe that that kind of thing. But uh, four men have been uh, on trial uh, in, in, in The Hague. Uh, one was found not guilty and the other three in absentia were, uh, were found guilty. And as uh, Hamish says, uh, happened after we saw it. He and I have seen it together. I mean, I've sat in the courtrooms in The Hague where people uh, who committed appalling crimes in Bosnia, for instance, um, they've, they've come up and they've been sentenced to life imprisonment and they're behind bars uh, at the moment, one of them in a British prison, as it turns out. And it's knowledge, it's knowing what has really happened and being able to back it up. You'll never convince the people who say, uh, it's all uh, it's all got up by the Western media, but if you have the evidence of what really went on, um, then at some stage you can get them in the dock and put them away for the rest of their lives. And I mean, I you know one of the one of the men who's uh, who was found guilty today is actually trying to get back to be quite a well-known case, trying to get back to fight a, a, in, in Ukraine. And the chances, therefore, that he might be uh, captured by the Ukrainian forces are sort of moderate. Um, but what a day that will be when that man who gave the instruction to fire the missile uh, is, is actually caught and can be returned to The Hague and can spend the rest of his life in jail. And, you know, there are so many of these crimes um, that we, we do, it's a form of, it's a form of criminal archaeology. It, it's essential to do what you do uh, in your professional lives, to be able to work out with scientific precision 
what happened when and the links between uh, one uh, um, uh, piece of evidence and another. It's the same thing that I do, and it's the same thing that, that Hamish does. And it's bloody essential, I think, for a, a decent and, you know, relatively clean world that we hope that we'll be going towards. Anyway, my con great congratulations, Sir Hamish. Thank you so much yeah, for hosting this, great. and I'm, I'm very grateful to you for listening to me. Thank you. <laughs>
special forces of one type or another. This, this chap was from the SAS and he didn't want to talk about it. And of course I was always prodding him. And I, you know, I had noticed when I came down to the bar that he'd kind of stand up and go away because he didn't uh, to talk too much about, about what he had done, which was what I was interested in. But what he did tell me was that in, I think, 2013 or 2014, not quite sure when, uh, he was said he was still serving as an SAS um, uh, um, the guy at that time. He's now long since left, and that's why he's doing this uh, sort of security stint. Um, and, but he was, he was sent as part of a, an SAS detachment to the Ukrainian army. And um, uh, to, to advise them, how do you fight a modern war? And interestingly, he said, when they arrived there, they found that the Ukrainian army was exactly like the Russian army, that you don't, you avoid taking any decisions. You pass every decision up to the level above you. And the level above you, so you're, you're a, if you're a soldier, you, you, you tell your sergeant, the sergeant tells the junior officer, junior officer tells the more senior officer. And so it goes until the general then gets onto the Kremlin or to the, the Ministry of, of, of Defense and says, what do I do there coming down the road? Um, and then it goes down, the decision comes right down the bed. And, and then, you know, somebody said, yeah, pull the trigger. Oh, okay, pull the trigger. And it takes, hours, perhaps days, and it blocks the thing. And this SAS man, I mean, maybe I, I'm no great military expert, maybe it, it's something that you all are, are familiar with, but I never did. He, he said, we taught the Ukrainians, it's much better to take the wrong decision than not to take any decision at all. Um, wrong decision you can maybe get around, but it's too late if you don't decide to do anything. And uh, he said that they they were now getting to the stage, the Ukrainians were getting nearly to the stage that the British Army is at, where um, just a, a sergeant can take the kind of decisions that quite senior officers uh, in an army like the Russian army would be expected to take. And so he said um, he sees signs of this all the time when he reads about or watches uh, how the the uh, Ukrainians are fighting, but they're not fighting the last war. They're fighting a totally different war from the, the one the Russians are fighting. And that's why, you know, when they were trying to attack Kiev in the first uh, days of the war back in, back in February, uh, the tanks just all came in a column down the road, which is, you know, why I don't think you're... Uh, tank people are going to be very successful and say we need, need loads more tanks and of course they were able to block off the back of the column by blowing up the tank at the back and blowing up the tank at the front and then just picking them off one by one and the Russians were still following that kind of basic you know I, I don't take decisions around here my of my senior officer does that so I, I'm certain that, uh, well, I mean, just based on what this SAS man was saying, but I, I'm certain that that is what uh, has been the success, the reason for the Ukrainian forces' success and the reason for the Russians doing relatively badly. We're preparing some drink behind the scenes, but there are lots of questions <laughs> before we do that. So go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm start with Daphne up front because you're in, <laughs> if I can put it this way, this is your special area of dark heritage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then we'll move around to Well, it's a question for John. And just, I've been wanting to ask this question of you for about 15 years. <laughs> 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 um, have you seen any patterns in your many years of war reporting? I mean, my interest is in cultural heritage, the destruction of cultural heritage, by which I don't mean only monuments and architecture and museums or cemeteries, but also just targeting of particularly important cultural figures, cultural communities, religious leaders. Have you found patterns in different kinds of wars, different patterns in terms of the intensity of targeting of cultural capital, cultural assets? 
Well, there are patterns, but they're not uh, necessary. It's not necessarily the same pattern. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think in terms of, for instance, what's happening in Ukraine, I saw various uh, sites which the Ukrainians regarded as being of uh, importance historically, um, uh, politically perhaps to them, which the Russians had destroyed. But I didn't feel the Ukrainians all said, of course, it's, it's deliberate they're doing, they're targeting this to destroy us as a nation. I didn't um, have that that sense at all. Um, I think I think Russians just um, attack anything they they can see, and a building is a target. Um, so, in 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 that sense, uh, th that's a kind of you know the most modern, uh, up to date version of, uh, of of fighting that we can see that we know of. Um, I think. It, when you have, a, an, a, as it were, an ideological uh, um, uh, battle going on, I'm thinking of, for instance, the Taliban um, blowing up the, the, the Buddhas. Uh, I, I went there um, in, in January, actually, um, and, and filmed it. Not to, I mean, all these years later, uh, and it is a long time because that was, what, 19... 89, I think, wasn't it? That they blew the well, 2000. 2000. 2001. Yeah, 2000, because that was the, the, the start of the whole uh, um, uh, episode with, with 9 11 and so on. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, but, I, you know, it, 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 it is a, a, an utter tragedy. What was even more tragic was that the, the government that uh, came in, in in 2001. Uh, with American and uh, European help, and uh, a lot of it and a lot of money, we're starting to get the, all the materials to put the Buddhas back in there. And then, of course, um, President Biden, in a decision that is really quite hard for anybody who loves Afghanistan to forgive, pulled out the, uh, the, the US troops and the Taliban are, are back there. And of course, there's absolutely no question that the, um, the, the, the materials will ever be put back while the, while the Taliban are in power. So that's, a, a, you know, there are, there are different um, um, targets for different, different outfits, I would say, the Russians don't really care what they're doing very much. Um, and uh, but organizations like the Taliban um, and ISIS, when it was still going, uh, going strong at any rate, um, you know, had a very clear idea of what they were doing. And to go back to Syria, which is um, uh, Hamish's um, big sort of uh, center of operations, I mean, there again, the Russian doctrine where you just smash everything because it, it's going to destroy the will of the other side to resist. That, um, uh, you can see that everywhere in Syria. So it just is different strokes for different folks. Before we move around, um, first of all, Marta and then um, Norm. Yes, my question is for Hamish, but also be for John. So thank you so no, much. <laughs> So you both stress the gathering of evidence so that eventually people can be brought to justice and end their lives in jail. But does that, okay, there's a justice in that when it happens, but does it ever act as a deterrent? It's just too, I mean, it's a possibility, but it's a quite rare possibility and it's too post hoc. Does it ever act as a deterrent? That's I, I, yeah, it should do, shouldn't it? It should. <laughs> but unfortunately, the business we're involved in, you know, you, you there's not a lot of, you know, the, there are not a lot of good stories coming out of it. I mean, to me, um, to me, when when you have nothing else to offer, it's it's something tangible, and I was really struck by that in Syria. I mean, the, I don't want to go on about it, but the Syrian people really 
you know, that really felt that we had left them adrift. And, you know, Syria, Damascus is probably closer than Keep. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's certainly a lot closer than Iraq and, and Afghanistan, where I spent a lot of my career. So, and, you know, it's a Mediterranean country almost, mm -hmm. you know, or it is a Mediterranean country, although we designate it Middle East. Um, and the, the, the atrocities happening, uh, and when, when we were doing nothing about it. So to me, just offering that as something, and, and as John has said, and as I know, you know, those, those people did eventually get their comeuppance. It absolutely should be a deterrence. But, you know, is Putin worrying about this? That, you know, is he, or Sabayakin, or any of those other uh, cronies that, that are working for him? So not a great answer. It should be, but it's not. But if we can't do something now, at least, which again, is so why I'm fascinated with, with, with your business. But, um, you know, it's, it's not all about the hit. If you can't sort, sort something out today, but you can sort it out tomorrow, then that's worth trying for. I think one of the problems is that soldiers are so much under the um, under the orders of their NCOs and their uh, their officers that they don't think they don't care about any wider kind of of, of command. So I must have seen twenty or thirty um, uh, videos. Um, just from just from you know street cameras and things of uh, Russian soldiers doing uh, dreadful things in some cases um, to the local population or in some cases just looting and so on. I mean we've all seen these things and they don't even bother to put masks on because they're not thinking oh Jesus Christ maybe I'll the Hague is is checking me. it's just you know my sergeant says I can do this and uh, so I'll I'll do it I'll carry on doing it Norman Hamish why did Putin take so many months to get around to targeting infrastructure uh, that's a good question I, I think he he was hoping and and I'm sure John and others will have, will have a view. I mean, he, he wasn't anticipating this going on any longer than a few weeks. Um, and it slightly goes back to my Obama red line. You know, he didn't expect the West, if, if we hadn't got involved very quickly, and you know, whatever you think about Boris, um, he gets a tick for that, um, we would be in a completely different position. It, it is very clear that the Russian sort of um, uh, strategic sort of uh, architecture for this particular campaign was pretty thin. Roll into Ukraine, you know, bit, bit of terror and, and we will roll up the whole place. Um, so I so I think that's the reason. They, they went very quickly to plan B. Um, you know, there are a whole host of things and I, I'm, I'm very keen to speak to John about Zelensky tonight. Um, <laughs> because to me, you know, Churchillian is the wrong expression, but having the right person in the right place who can articulate, you know, I'm sure he's not making a lot of you know, the decisions he's making. He's probably be, he's probably got a lot of very good people around him, and I'm sure he's getting a lot of very good intelligence from from the West. Um, but the but, but the whole campaign design seems to be very very limited. Um, uh, again, as John said, straight up the middle with the tanks, they'll capitulate, we'll take over. They want us there anyway, we want to get rid of these Nazis sort of thing. You know, the, the whole thing is completely bizarre. Um, and when things started going wrong, it was right, well, let what happened, what worked in Syria? Ah, well, killing lots of civilians work. Killing, I mean, the, the infrastructure in Syria, in, in particularly in Idlib, is absolutely devastated. You know, there's no, well, there might be now, but certainly at the height of the the war there were no mains there's no sanitation no no nothing um and i think that's why he's taken so long but you know it has been incredibly effective and i'm just worried that the the next part of it is is the power station so very long answer to your question i didn't if, if you had asked putin on the 24th of february if he would have lost Kherson in november mm. he'd go you're mad mm. you know it, it'll be russia way before Presumably one complication is the origin myth of Russia is that Kiev is Rus. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and as a schoolboy, I read yeah. that, yeah. uh, which is all about the old going, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. if you're destroying your cultural heritage in that way, 
that is a disaster for the myth that is being celebrated. I think, Norman, there is a, a specific reason. If they if they'd done it in uh, July or something, mm -hmm. the Ukrainians would have had the time to repair it in time for winter. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I think it's general winter, just like it was in um, uh, in, in in the, in the uh, Tolstoy. You know that um, the that's the weapon that he's hoping to use, and they're destroying the the heating and the lighting now because they think it'll have an effect. I've been to lots and lots of places which have been attacked by bigger countries. I've been in Serbia, for instance, attacked by NATO forces who did very much the same sort of thing. It wasn't in the winter, but they, uh, you know, attacked the power stations and so forth. Um, two things. One, it is amazing how fast people can get those systems going again. And secondly, it doesn't work. People don't say, oh, Jesus Christ, I've got no power. We, we must surrender. <laughs> they say, we must fight those bastards harder. And that was true in Belgrade in 1999. And it's uh, it's true in, in Ukraine now. Right. John, I've got one comment for you about the Bamiyan Buddhas. Mm. Um, the Taliban pulverized those with heavy artillery yep. and explosives. There isn't anything there to reconstruct. They no, but there's, there's the same, um, uh, there are blocks of, of, uh, of the same stone. And they were going to replace them with that. I mean, when you go there, the the blocks are are, are as high as this building uh, in the in the background. But of course, you know, not going to be used. And they did have some bits left. But of course, the main things was were the the photographs and the mm -hmm. videos, so they knew exactly how to uh, what they should do to 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 replace them. We get shortly. We're going to move next door to discuss informally. But first of all, Matt, and then um, Rob, and then perhaps a third person. Chrissy, thank you very much, both of you, for coming and offering such a sort of powerful uh, accounts. Uh, um, I think it's really hugely important. So thank you very much. And it, it, we both, I think, very rightly stress the importance of, of evidence um, to, to be able to persecute atrocities, et cetera. It, it seems to be a really crucial moment that sort of undermined public faith in, in the evidence is the, the evidential base that was constructed around the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And then the, the significant doubt that's, that was then cast on that afterwards. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on, in a sense, those kind of massive political mistakes in, in undermining the faith in the evidence that, that people like yourselves work so assiduously to, to produce. And, and, and just your general thoughts on your frustrations, perhaps, with some of that. <laughs> that is a great question. And, and funny, somebody has asked me to take part in a documentary on exactly that point. You're, you're right. It's, it's yeah, the, the whole invasion of Iraq thing, I think, it has dented people's um, uh, respect for certainly, you know, UK, Western based intelligence. Um, and it, it's, and we, we're still, still seeing the fallout of that. Um, and you know how, how do we how, how do we convince people in in this world of of fake news propaganda disinformation um it, it's it's a huge challenge and you know quite you know if you throw enough stuff at the wall it will stick i mean i you know i probably like john but you know i, I get a hell of a going over from the russian trolls and others in fact there was a, a sting by the bbc and the uh, the um, Commission for Justice and Accountability a few months ago, um, and the Times too, where um, a certain professor at a Scottish university, why on earth he's still employed by them, I don't know, uh, thought he was being paid $100,000 by the FSB, the Russian Secret Service, um, to spy on people in Britain. And the whole thing was about, about me actually being an MI6 agent and, and the Russians should take me out. Now, that you know, it was such a load of complete rubbish. There are about a hundred emails all involved in this that were just complete and utter lies. And um, you know, I, and if it wasn't so serious, it would have been so funny. Um, but but uh, you're right. How do we get back that confidence in what's been done? And you know, a lot of it is is around our politicians. Uh, in my particular area, in the sort of Ken Byer stuff, I found it 
you know, politicians understand bombs and bullets. They didn't understand the stuff I was talking about, which is why they sort of ignored it. When I was trying to tell David Cameron about the, the chemical attack in, in, in uh, Ghouta, I, I could just see he couldn't understand it. And I, I thought I'm reasonably good at explaining things, but he just he just didn't get it. But um, it's it's something that, that we need to work really hard on and we need to you know have faith in the people that are giving that intelligence and and we it's going to take a while i mean the the iraq 2003 thing is is absolutely bar you know it's a travesty and having been involved in the first gulf war and that gulf war and you know having had friends that that, that were killed I mean, you know i personally feel it and um but but it, you know that that's backwards we've, we've got to look forwards and it's about it's i think it's about trusting the evidence and it's it's also about politicians and senior people in the military and elsewhere, you know, doing the right thing. You know, there, a, a lot of time these disasters happen when a lot of unforeseen events happen and and conspire to produce something that's really significant. And I, I think that's what happened with the Kelly report and and in two thousand and three. But also, there were yeah, you know, I, I know Alistair Campbell quite well for a whole variety of reasons. But he and his ilk and others. You know, they they had an agenda, and you know, I don't think they were brave enough to change their their mind. And that that is, you know, that's what we expect our leaders to do. So, I'm sure John will give a much better example. But yeah, we are suffering from that, and it's probably up to people like John and myself to try and make sure that uh, the right information gets out there, and we hold people to account if we think they're doing the wrong thing. I, I um, you know, it's my job to be by, uh, unbiased and to be uh, impartial on these things. But I didn't, I never thought it was my job uh, to kind of act as a cheerleader for what was obviously always going to be a, a disaster in some way in 2003 and in 2002 i spent quite a lot of time in washington in the build-up uh, to the war and when i interviewed people i i was um i felt it was a a, a duty really to tell them what what was i didn't know what was going to happen i couldn't i couldn't uh, of course uh, work out the disastrous effect of it i couldn't for instance, it never occurred to me that the Americans might um, uh, introduce torture as a as a, a method of, of 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 coping with the country. I I had a rather pathetic faith in them, uh, but I do remember talking. I remember most of the people, Douglas Fife and um, uh, oh, the, all the kind of either the just the sort of lower slightly lower uh, level of people uh, decision makers um uh, who all defended the whole thing but i remember that colin powell uh, who was the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff um agreed that it was a disaster and i remember I, it was late in the evening saying to him but surely you've got to still tell them this and he, he said to me, listen, they, they'll they take no notice of me and my own position will be weakened if I say this. They are so determined to go through with this and, and do whatever it takes. But you're quite right. I mean, we still live. Uh, and I, you know, my uh, uh, profession, apart from anything else, still lives under the uh, the, the shadow of all that and the weapons of mass destruction. All that absolute uh, outrageous rubbish. I, I, I mean, I've known, I've known um, uh, um, Alice Campbell since the 1980s. I'm amazed he's now managed to climb back into it as a sort of the kind of serious um, arbiter of of national affairs. And if we haven't had a, a series of prime ministers like 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 we have done. I don't think he'd have been able to do that. But um, you know, it, it just shows you, I suppose, that if you last long enough, you come back on top again. <laughs> I'll resist the, the temptation to go back to Alistair Campbell. Um, I come from the, 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 the evolutionary end of anthropology, so my questions are very broad. Now, you you both lived lives of exposed to a lot of violence. And a lot of 
combat and in a sense we all are because we watch it on on the news every night and in in, in the anthropological in the evolution anthropological literature there's a great interest actually in, in people like Richard Wrangham or, 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 or Stephen Pinker who actually say the evidence suggests we are living in the most peaceful times ever mm. and that you know hunter-gatherers you know must dug up enough of these you know stood a much greater chance of dying in violence and warfare than any of us do and indeed you know we only look back i just wondered how do you square you know your own personal experiences with what is the empirical evidence that actually you never had it so good which is hard to believe um, but 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 it's probably empirically true it is it is i mean and i feel a little bit <laughs> personally kind of um, diminished really by it because uh, until about 2016 I suppose perhaps even a little bit earlier uh, I used to regularly give talks to people in, in which I said look you know in every virtually every possible uh, uh, way of, of assessing and counting it we are so much better uh, in the 21st century than even we were towards the end of the 20th century. And, you know, you go over things like um, how the Chinese and Indians have lifted a billion people out of poverty. Um, I saw a thing just this morning that said that something like 76% of the world's entire population can read and write. I mean, that's extraordinary. And you're absolutely right. But we've just had these, uh, um, we, 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 we had Putin in 2014 taking possession of Crimea and taking us back to the bad old 20th century days. And now, you know, I, I actually don't think it's going to happen, but I, I well, you know, I'm so would be so easily wrong. I mean, why change the habits of a lifetime? But, but I don't think China is actually going to invade Taiwan, but it could happen. And, and you know, just a, a few months ago, I was thinking, yeah, I think the bungers are going to do it. So um, we're back on, you know, what you might think of as the sort of late 1930s uh, approach to international life and and uh, and and the relations between between states but i can't help because i'm a i'm i'm an optimist and i've i've got a, a lot of reason if you've seen people dancing on the top of the berlin wall on the night it happened as i did you'll never be a pessimist again actually <laughs> and at some stage uh, putin will go away, uh, be arrested, be killed, whatever, and Russia will be a different country as a result of his going. And at some stage, the same thing will happen to Xi Jinping and the, the power of the Chinese Communist Party. It will go, you know, I, I saw how the, um, the demonstrations uh, in Tiananmen Square paralyzed the entire communist state for nearly a month. Uh, back in in 1989, and so when you've seen these things, you can't unsee them, and you can't say to yourself, "Oh God, these monster uh, um, uh, state structures are bound to last." Like we used to think about the Soviet Empire, you know, bound to bound to last forever, and then it it when it comes to it, it's it's like breaking a biscuit, you know, it's so. It's so uh, got so little force, and having seen that, I I I do, I do think that um, uh, you know we we will get back to that early twenty first century feeling that we are changing things. The relationship between one country and another is different from how it was in the twentieth century and before. But I, at the moment, I'm still uh, you know embarrassed to think of all those people that will be saying to themselves, I saw that stupid bastard and he said everything was getting better and you've only got a look around and it's all. Um, I think yeah, it, 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 that's another really interesting perspective. I suppose my 23 years in the military, I was mostly fighting counterinsurgency. Only the first Gulf War was traditional. Um, and I probably, I, you know, I don't want to sound cynical, but probably 
have seen 30 to 40 friends killed over that 25 years. You know, had I been a First World War or Second World War soldier, you, you could have put at least one or two noughts on, on, on that figure. Um, but I think looking at what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, whatever, whatever figures are happening, um, it would appear the Russians are probably off 70,000 dead, 200,000 injured. They've off two and a half thousand tanks. Now that that is sort of Second World War type levels. So um, I, I I think you're right, and I actually hope you're right um, that things are a lot better than they were back in back in you know sort of uh, back in the days that you were talking about. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure John will agree. You know, violence and death is you know is horrific at whatever scale it is. No, I agree. I mean, obviously. You come here to talk to the long perspective, and it doesn't get longer than than, yeah. than that. But I, I mean, for, for me, it's trying to square the, yeah. the, the, the terribly, you know, the immediate impact that these things have on us. Both the Berlin Wall, which I remember equally, you know, and the, you know, the, the Islip and so on, square that personal experience with you know, hard data. And it's, yeah. it's, um, I did have one last question, <laughs> and then we can go and talk in four minutes. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you both so much for your remarks. I have I have a very brief interjection about the Russian military that I wanted to make, and then I do have a question for Hamish. Um, I had to check my notes of my correspondence with my brother who was involved in the training of Ukrainian uh, military in the years leading up to the conflict, because I didn't want to mess this up. But um, I think it's important to note that the Russian military uh, still doesn't have an NCO class. Yeah, and right. this, as much as we're talking about the hierarchization of moving up a huge chain of command and down a chain of command, not having NCOs, uh, you know, creates a more, I don't know, it, it complicates it. It's another layer, but it's, an, it's a crucial layer for greasing communications between ordinary soldiers and officer classes. And when you don't have that, it means that there's even more hesitancy and reluctance to send anything up or to you know offer a different opinion. Um, so I thought that was kind of very interesting to see that what they've done in Ukraine is built in, you know, um, NCOs and and that that creates that possibility. Um, and I wanted to ask. I was I was in uh, I was in Beirut for many years. I I wanted to thank you, Hamish, for what you said about red lines because I certainly remember preparing to evacuate in 2013. And when that didn't happen, even though it was much more convenient for me personally to not have to evacuate, it was devastating. And I've really never gotten over it. Um, so thank you for, for mentioning the importance of that. And I do think that red lines, especially when they've been laid out on the table, you know, I'm a pacifist, but we need to follow through at the same point in time, so essential. But that being said, I wanted to ask you as someone who lived in Beirut for a long time and loves it very much, um, if I could ask you to elaborate a little bit on your involvement in uh, the after effects of the Beirut blast. Is there any possibility of the type of accountability that you were speaking of? Do we have or is there a possibility that we will have the type of evidence required to hold anybody for account? Um, I'll, I'll try to keep this short. Your point about NCOs, you know, the British Army, the American Army and most NATO countries you know, they live on their NCOs. Without them, you know, we are we are hardly we are we would be like the Russians, and that's important. On the Beirut thing, it should be. I, I mean, absolutely. You know, storing 2,700 2, tons of ammonium nitrate, which is the Taliban's you know most favoured explosive. I mean, in, in its in its own, it's not. But you, with an accelerant, this stuff explodes with the effect of. Of TNT or or, or uh, Centex almost. Um, the fact that it was stored there, it's not that, I mean, my concern is there is a lot of other ammonium nitrates stored in ports all around the world. Mm -hmm. And you need to store, you, you know, it needs to be looked after. I'm, my fa family of farmers in Dorset, we've got ammonium nitrate on the farm for fertilizer, but, um, you know, and if it's not stored rightly, it will blow up. Um, so it should be dead easy. But you will probably understand the politics of, of Lebanon and Beirut far better than I. Um, so I, I, I hope there is, but there needs to be determination to do it. All I did, there, there's a lot of other contaminated material around that port. Yeah. In fact, I counted 74 other 
um, 44 ISO containers full of some pretty nasty stuff, which we managed to get moved and secured. Um, so it should be. And, and your point about, you know, I think you'll find most soldiers are pacifists. I'm certainly a pacifist, but um, unfortunately, there's some times when one has to put one's pacifism aside for the, for the, for the, you know, the greater good of everybody. All I can say in conclusion is the quality and immediacy of the questions followed the quality and immediacy of the presentations. And it's been one a really successful event for me anyway. But not having experienced violence, I do feel I understand what is happening in this world today much more clearly, thanks to the two of you. So I'd like to... Yeah.